Our next speaker, Dexter Liggett Gordon. Uh, there are two things you need to know about Dexter. He designs his own shirts and he cares about making products that solve important problems for people. Dexter is the CEO and co-founder of Swarm, a community connecting founders with freelance tech builders who wanna solve problems and build impactful projects together. His career spans technology, public service and policy, all of which converge into his domain focus on the future of work and education. Dexter co-founded and led product design and engineering for Caliber, the first company from the Philippines admitted into Y Combinator. Being a pioneer was both a source of pride and a challenge to build an ecosystem of talent, funding, and technology around the budding company. Dexter loves to mentor up and coming young entrepreneurs and learn from tech and product leaders across the globe. For a talk on building a tech company without a tech ecosystem, please welcome Dexter Liggett Gordon to Techsylvania. Hi, Trevor. It's really great to be here. Hello, everyone. I'm Dexter. Um, I'm now actually in uh, halfway across the world in uh, Manila, Philippines. And I really wanted to share with you just some of my own experiences building a tech company in a part of the world that at the time in which we started a tech company, not many founders had thought or tech entrepreneurs or venture capitalists thought about the Philippines at the time. And I wanted to share a few lessons, especially now that I'm starting a second company. So, um, I, so as Trevor mentioned, I started uh, Caliber um, and Swarm, both of which actually were started and founded in the Philippines. I wanted to share with you my journey in becoming a tech entrepreneur, which really is a story of unlikely circumstances. So another thing, maybe the third thing to know about me building my own shirts uh, uh, designing my own shirts is that I'm actually from San Francisco. And here's, um, this is actually where I live. This is my house in San Francisco, my office, which was in city hall, right across the street. My brother, he lived at, down on an alleyway called Natoma in San Francisco. My grandparents lived near Folsom. Um, and just for good measure, I put in where my barber, uh, lived, uh, where my barber was. And one of the things that I wanted to share with you is that, as it turned out, the same neighborhood that I lived in where I grew up became the global epicenter for the tech industry. My family was enraged when Twitter built its original office because it blocked the view of the Bay Bridge from my grandparents' apartment. Airbnb's office space when it was in an old office building where they sold printing equipment just down the street from my brother's place. Zendesk, Zendesk's office was just around the corner from my childhood barber, and there was a small neighborhood store on the ground floor where I would buy chewing gum and baseball cards when I was a kid. If ever there was a place to start a tech company, it wouldn't just be in San Francisco, but it would be in the precise neighborhood where I grew up. And you might think that, well, this is destiny, that I was definitely in the right place to start a tech company. But actually, that's not where my journey started as a tech entrepreneur. It started more than 11,000 kilometers away, more than half a century ago. It started with my grandparents' generation. Three generations of my family had to leave the Philippines in order to find work. And that meant that three generations of my family had to rebuild their lives from scratch in a new homeland. My grandfather sailed the seas as a merchant marine. He's the person in the green uh, circle up top. And my mom sold Victorian houses. This is my mom uh, holding, and that's not me, this is my, my little cousin. My mom sold Victorian houses in San Francisco. My grandmother, well, she made the best fried chicken <laughs> that I've ever had. Uh, coincidentally, it's both of their birthdays this week. So happy birthday, grandma, happy birthday, mom. This is my family. We all settled in California to, in search of a better life. And what, what more impactful way to, to show that we had resettled in new homeland is that this is actually a picture of us at Thanksgiving and at the center of the table is a turkey 
where we are celebrating an all-American tradition of Thanksgiving. And something important to know is, well, why did the Philippines, you know, force them to leave? And the reason why is because the Philippines was drained of economic opportunity. The country was run by a dictatorship that actually collapsed. And in the wake of the political and social instability, and after during a period of martial law, the economy broke down and sputtered along for decades. What was called the Pearl of the Orient in the center of East-West trade since the 16th century, it became known as the sick man of Asia. And I know this full and well because I actually studied political econo economics and development in school. All of the miracle economies that sprouted out during the 1990s sprouted out exactly around the Philippines. Political failure stunted the Philippines' growth, while at the same time, political leadership prompted the growth of the companies all around the Philippines. In the Philippines, wages remained low, even though it had one of the highest literacy rates and college graduation rates in the world. People were leaving the country in droves. In 2007, I actually went backpacking through Southeast Asia. It's actually what hipsters dream about doing when they saved up enough money in their 20s. Um, and that's what I did. And in 2007, aside from the history and culture of the places that I visited, what I remember was seeing evidence of their economic boom. Just meters from the Penang airport in Malaysia, the number two city in Malaysia, you could see evidence of the growth. Intel, Lockheed Martin, Microsoft, they were all opening operations just you know, outside of the airport. And for decades, the tallest building in the world was the Petronas Towers in Kuala Lumpur. Singapore was actually overtaking Hong Kong and Tokyo as the Asian finance hub. Indonesia and Thailand were emerging as agricultural and conglomerate driven pockets of growth. I was both excited for the Philippines, or for the region, but ultimately I was sad for the Philippines. The question that always lingered was when would the Philippines have its turn? And so after my exciting backpacking trip, I went back home. I went back to my day job working for the mayor of San Francisco I used to work in a policy area called workforce development, where we actually prepared people for jobs in high growth industries. My career choice was actually inspired by my family's need to leave their homeland in order to find work. Now, ever since, I always worked to connect people with opportunity. After living across the street from my office, 80% of my life happened on a stage that was four blocks in radius. Things were stable, went on for another four years. But sadly, working for government was really frustrating and dealing with the politics took more effort than dealing with a problem, which was actually what I was passionate about. How do we connect people with jobs? So I resigned, headed back to the Philippines to reassess my life and all the things, all the possessions I've taken with me in the Philippines in 2011 fit in these two bags. And the first thing that I noticed when I came back to the Philippines in 2011 was that there was a tectonic shift. The Philippines had actually changed. I reconnected with an old classmate, Paul. This is him, uh, the one without the hair. I was actually much skinnier then. And he actually started an outsourcing company in Manila. And the clients in the background, I don't know if you can see it, it's Mint, Intuit, Adkami. They're value-based companies. And the Philippines was emerging from the sick man of Asia to becoming the fastest growing economy in the world. The GDP at the time turned out was growing at 8% per year. And what was propelling the growth was that a lot of the companies that were growing back then was the outsourcing industry. Emerson, Convergis, Siemens, Genpak, Accenture, SAP, SAG. To put it simply, companies were moving their operations into low-cost labor markets. The economy was booming, but it wasn't innovation that was driving it. It was outsourcing driven. The labor market was changing so fast that, it, that the platforms that match talent with jobs just didn't cut it. There, there was no real local solution to, to, to solve that problem. 
They were no better than Craigslist. And this is where my founder journey started. This is the problem that I was passionate about and the conditions finally presented themselves for me to be able to have this place and time and resources to solve it. So Paul and I started my first company, a tech company called Caliber that used AI to match talent with jobs locally in the Philippines. We focused in the Philippines first, but we had aspirations to grow globally. We're the first actual Filipino company to get into Y Combinator. And it was actually the first batch where they accepted um, international startups for the first time. Here on the, the picture to the left is Paul Graham, is the, uh, the founder of, uh, of YC. And here in the middle is Eduardo Savarin, who actually swung by Caliber's office on his Philippines tour to check out the local tech ecosystem. And from what I hear from Songbirds, Eduardo Savarin, I think, has Romanian roots. And that's interesting because in the Philippines, we're kind of big news since we're the first kind of globally minded tech company. But it also is the same, it also was a problem because what made starting a company in the Philippines so challenging is that there was no ecosystem. The local VCs were just as old as we were. Global investors viewed the Philippines as risky. We couldn't hire local experienced talent. And in essence, if we wanted to build a company, we needed to build the ecosystem around us. And this is what I wanted to share with you today. Now that I'm starting my second company, I'm bringing a lot of those lessons into this new venture. I'm still passionate about the same problem, but there's things that I learned with Calibre that I felt could help expedite the process of building a company around us. So the second company is called Swarm and our vision is to connect talent with opportunity globally. We believe that where you are and where you come from should never be barriers for you to connect with awesome opportunities. So we're building a high trust community of software developers, engineers, and product managers, and we're connecting them with founder-led projects in the Valley and globally. We wanna expose people who are freelancers and moonlighters to projects and products that are getting built at the center of innovation. And the world shift to remote work during the pandemic has really hastened this shift. Today, we're meeting remotely, whereas two years ago, you know, if we're doing this, if I attended this conference in person, we're probably having the session after a night of wine and a dinner of sarmale, which I love cabbage and I love rolls. And I think when I researched it, it was probably one of the best things ever. Now I'd like to share with you what I learned from my first company and how I'm leading my second company. So the first challenge, the local market is too small. If you wanna build a startup that grows like a rocket, rocket ship, you have to solve a problem that a lot of people have. Sometimes the local market is too small. So focus on, a problem, on problems that are universal, that are universal, that you're passionate about, and that have regional or global scope. So my second company focuses on a global problem. We connect global product teams with value-based projects. We assemble teams in Southeast Asia, Eastern Europe, with prod and pull them together with projects in the, the US. So one of the reasons why this is like critical is because if you're planning to raise VC funds, this is where the most important question comes up. Is your TAM big enough? Are you solving a large enough problem and does solving that problem reach a total addressable market in the billions? Because solving a big problem is evidence that is the foundation for um, building a product that a lot of people will buy or that has a high value. You can think locally, but and you can build locally, but think about growing globally. Build locally, grow go globally. The second challenge, it's probably the most practical one. There's a funding gap. It's hard to raise money in the local markets. It was a case when we tried to build a caliber in the Philippines. If we were raising money for a swarm in the Philippines, primarily it would also be a challenge. But here's the opportunity. And at the time of this writing, the valley is flush with liquidity. And I recommend to you looking for angel investors 
and early stage seed round VCs that are based in the Valley. And here's why. In the last five to 10 years, it's not just the co-founders of companies, like the, the top level folks that are investing. Who's investing now, the vast majority are actually the early staff of those rocket ship companies. Um, many of them have reached massive windfalls as the Decacorns were getting built. Their network, they understand your journey and how to build companies from a practical point of view. It'll connect to a later point that I'm about to make. And what's also more important is that they know your journey personally. They were, they were in your shoes as early stage, as people building early stage companies. And from my sense of the current market is there's not as much value sensitivity, unless the valuations are like totally out of whack. The difference in reason why I mean less mature ecosystems, like where I come from, uh, or where I decided to uh, start my first and second company, is that a lot of the local investors, angel investors, they're either investing like family money that they're using bankers or financial advisors um, to do that, and they have they don't they have trouble adapting to the fast pace and high risk investment kind of environments. So, bottom line, in some raise your money in the valley or in the EU ecosystems, I hear that Berlin and London are kind of um, kind of centers of uh, finance for the startup ecosystem in Europe. If your local market, say if you need to sell into your local markets, syndicating, finding local investors to follow on with your angel investors who are in the Valley or in London or Berlin might be important. And really what that's about is trying to find investors who are familiar with the local landscape that to give like the, the global investors more comfort that somebody's looking after the investment. So here's a pro tip. Uh, there are places that um, and, and clubs and spaces that are now designed to kind of create these kinds of connections. I actually found a few of my angel investors for my new venture there. Uh, Lunch Club, it's free to join. On Deck, which is a fellowship uh, that's cohort based. I actually got in, I think uh, Vlad um, who also is a member of On Deck. Texylvania, they're working actively to connect you with investors, right? So challenge number three. It's really hard to find experienced talent. And this is a critical one. This is probably the most impact, the, the hardest thing to solve for. But this is what I learned in how to crack it. I'm always like for, you know, the agenda of improving curriculum at schools. But to be pragmatic, we have to accept the fact that they're always going to be slower than the labor market. The hardest thing about building a tech ecosystem without an, uh, a tech company without an ecosystem is that you can't just hire people at other companies who use current techniques, technical frameworks, or just that downright innovation and scrappy mindset. The local labor markets often aren't exposed to problem solving in the context of innovation and taking novel products to market. So what do you do? I'll share with you what I did. So probably this is the most practical piece of advice that I can give to you. First, when you're just like raising your first money, choose angel investors um, that are aligned with helping you, that are incentivized to help you succeed, um, and mentors who will help you train and be connectors for your first 10 employees. So, you know, as you are selecting them, choose folks who can be, who can be hands-on with them. So this person who's wearing the Facebook apron, I don't know that Facebook made aprons, but it's Andy Wong. Uh, he's helping us build our sales infrastructure. He's our early uh, angel investor, and he's the one who helped scale Facebook and Google's uh, small and medium enterprise uh, teams. So he's actually the one who helped scale up Facebook and scale up uh, Google for their largest line of business. He's an angel investor. Bernard Liang was an early DoorDash engineer who helped scale their data science program. So, th And they're both investors, so they're aligned to wanting to make you successful. And you know, if, you're, if you don't have a team yet, you know, perhaps one of the things that I want to suggest to you is get exposed to how people in centers of innovation think, how they solve problems, and how they, they you know, how they build, right? So one thing that you can easily do if you don't have a team yet is to work on projects, freelance projects, consultancy projects with value or US-based companies, like people who are building early, early stage companies who are building products. See firsthand how they wrestle with problems and let them challenge you in your thinking. 
So this is uh, this this photo here uh, is Dean Howard. Dean's actually the head, was the head of design at eBay at the time uh, for eBay Motors, and he helped us shape. So he was actually um, an advisor for Caliber, my first company. Dean helped us shape our design culture. He actually flew out with the Philippines to do two retreats. He did weekly design reviews with our designers. He helped us build a, not just design practices, but a culture that was centered around problem solving. And what's interesting is like a lot the designers that we had trained in that period under kind of Dean's mentorship now are sought after like design heads here in the Philippines for other startups, for other companies. Uh, the product manager at the time is now the head of um, Canva's uh, video product. Uh, she's uh, she's our product manager, who's actually Dean's project manager for that for his uh, mentorship. So you can build that culture around learning and training, which will allow you to develop the talent that is hard to recruit from in your local ecosystem. So we actually hired for potential and focused very intensively on their development by exposing them to folks, in our view, from the Valley. We got first-hand exposure. Dan's also somebody who built the company and sold it to, uh, to eBay. So he understood that journey. He was an advisor, got hands-on. Okay. Ah, fourth, this is probably one of my favorites. Um, communities and ecosystems always start as a relationship between a few people, between a few friends, um, partners, organizations, companies. Like the founders of uh, Texylvania were uh, friends and colleagues from a company, Philip and Vlad. It's and Trevor. I mean, it's great that you. It's my first time meeting Trevor. I just admired his beard from afar. Um, it's great that you've built Texylvania to gather. <laughs> yeah, I'm a fan. You know, you're gathering folks now virtually, globally. You know, but I would have at the drop of a dime, I would have come out to Cluj, and I would have, you know, I wanted to. I saw the video of like the race cars. I was like, I would be all over it. But it's really the nature of those relationships between people that's important. Investing and helping other fledgling startups is how ecosystems get built. And it's paying that trust forward, even if people haven't yet earned it, is the only way in which those early stage ecosystems grow. Just last week, I did a talk with a company called Paymongo, which is the second company in the Philippines to get into Y Combinator. It happened six years after Calibre. And now they're growing faster than Calibre ever was. They're kind of the darling of the Philippines ecosystem, kind of they're uh, being tracked as the first uh, unicorn, billion dollar company to come out of the Philippines. So, you know, it's all, all reasons why I should be jealous. But guess what? When they're preparing their application for OI Combinator, um, they came to me, asked for help, preparing for their interview, I gave them frank advice. I helped them kind of shape their early ideas and how to communicate that to investors and to the Y Combinator team. Uh, and when they finally got in, when, when they got seed funding, I helped them build their first kind of rung, advise them on how to build their first rung of managers. And when I, when I started my second company, you know, while I kind of mentored them in the start of their company, they turned around and mentored me to kind of understand the current landscape for the Valley. Uh, they connected me with their investors. They invested in my company ourselves. And now there's like eight, eight or nine companies that are in, in Y Combinator as, as the marker of like a global ecosystem. And this is really how ecosystems kind of get built. You just have to pay it for it. I didn't know them when, when they first asked me for help. They were just talented and they had a really important problem, which is to solve payments. And paying that trust forward came tenfold and them helping me build my own company when it was my turn to build a company. Ecosystems are important. Find your tribe, pay that trust forward. So you don't need to be based in the valley to build an innovation tech driven uh, tech company. Get exposure, exposure to folks who are in the valley, people who are building interesting projects. If you're not building a company, get exposure by working on freelance projects with those kinds of folks and uh, build community, um, you know, and build community as you're building your product, you know, and something that I want to leave with you is that, you know, Swarm, my company, my new company, it's about community. And we're here because we're building 
and connecting talent from parts of the world that are talented, but are unknown, that are often overlooked, that when you think of innovation, you know, the parts of the world that we're in, whether if it's the Philippines, Southeast Asia, Eastern Europe, it's not top of mind. But this is the opportunity where we can start that ecosystem. You know, this talk is happening across Southeast Asia and Eastern Europe, the Alliance of the East, where we're transitioning from services and an economy where we're helping companies just be more efficient to actually being innovators ourselves. I'm looking forward to the day where we can have this conversation in, in person. I'm looking forward to the day when you know, I can call on you and ask for you for advice and help, and you can do the same. And that's what we want Swarm as a company to be. It's a place to, to gather product builders, to give feedback, to get feedback, to build trust, to find collaborators, to work on the projects where people can innovate. It's a simple vision. And it's rooted in just my team's passion for connecting people and opportunity, no matter where they are, no matter where they come from. So that's the end of my talk. Check us out. We're at httpswarm.work. And please email me if you have any questions. But I'm happy to take a few here. Yeah. So, I mean, I have a question, if you don't mind. We still have five minutes left. So. Sure. Uh, yeah, first off, I want to say uh, I really enjoyed uh, your presentation here. I want to say that even especially today in 2021, I'm um, feeling a sense of community, you know, during a pandemic where everyone is away from you. It's it's a really, really fascinating product. And I, I would encourage uh, anyone to go check it out. Uh, but I have a question specifically. So, you know, the Philippines uh, and I'm going to re relate it back to Romania. Uh, they're not the, they're not Silicon Valley. They're not the United States. Right. So. Yeah. What would be, I guess, your biggest piece of advice for young entrepreneurs who get very frustrated with with the various things that might be holding them back, which, which to be fair, are very frustrating, uh, you know what I mean, obstacles at times? What would be your biggest piece of advice to them to continue to move forward? Yeah, so first is to um, the start, like we have the saying, to start with the problem, to, to fall in love with the problem, because the solutions will come and go, especially as technology changes, as preferences change. So find a problem that you're passionate about, which will carry you through the frustrations. And secondly, build a network where you can go to feedback. And you know we use this phrase, the sounding board, to, to just vet out your ideas and get feedback. Feedback is the lifeblood of innovation. Getting, uh, being probed and challenged from a sense of care and a sense of wanting you to be successful will go a long way in helping you work through those frustrations. Because yes, it's not the valley, like, you know, like sometimes just the trust environments don't exist in Asia. Yeah. I assume also what I've heard is the same in, in Eastern Europe, but kind of, you know, we can connect. I'm My, my email address is here. Connect with me, right? Join yeah. Swarm. There's folks who are who can help connect you uh, and, and provide you that level of support. Vlad and I met in a call like this, you know, four months ago, and then we just started to promote the heck out of uh, uh, Texylvania here and Texylvania promoted Swarm over there. So it can happen if we pay that sense of trust forward. Yeah, no, I think that's such an awesome message. And, and especially a product like Swarm where you don't have to be alone. You can find like-minded people anywhere across the world join together. I think it's awesome, Dexter, thank you. Yeah, awesome. So uh, next next year, uh, hopefully we're past the pandemic. We'll, we'll do this in person uh, in that part of the world. And I'll invite you guys over here to this part of the world to, for you guys to enjoy your beaches. <laughs> yeah, and uh, maybe Manny Pacquiao will be president. So who knows? Oh, right? that's, that's, let's, uh, that's, that's a joke, not joke, because it's, it's <laughs> here in the Philippines, things like that can happen. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, well we, we know here in the United States, trust us. Um, yeah. So thank you, Dexter, very much for your talk today. Uh, Swarm.work, please check it out. And I hope to meet you next year in person in Transylvania because it'll be awesome. <laughs> awesome, Trevor. See you.